Welcome everyone to this virtual ASA worship service. That is, welcome to our real worship service together in this digital meeting space. Uh, this morning, we will have both live and recorded portions to the service. Uh, I'm live at the moment, at least I think I am. All right. Uh, the service will proceed unannounced. Um, the ASA Sunday morning service is a highlight for all of us each year. As we come into uh, this new space, uh, we look around and uh, we see old friends and new. Um, this is not our home church. We're all visitors here. But please know that you are welcome and all are friends. And that the Lord is with us across space and time. In a face-to-face -face worship, we would hand out a printed order of service as you come in. But today, uh, we're providing for you uh, in the online chat window an outline of our service uh, as it will proceed. We're feeling a bit like Paul's uh, growing new Greek congregation. We're full of questions as we start worship. Uh, so let's turn our hearts to the Lord, uh, hold those questions, and shut down the chat field for a bit until after the service. And then at the benediction, uh, Vicki's going to give us some instructions. Uh, we'll take a short break uh, between the service, and we'll come back in a new link and you can pick up a coffee and do what you need then and uh, take a break. And then we'll have a, a, a time to talk together uh, then. So please uh, feel free to sing and praise the Lord throughout the morning. Uh, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Uh, of course, uh, your individual mics are going to be muted, but we'll be together here in spirit. Now let us come to worship. Hear these words from the Psalms. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him glorious praise. We enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us worship the Lord. See 
Hello, boys and girls. Some of you might even be future scientists. I'm Craig Story from Ipswich, Massachusetts, and I'm a science teacher and part of the ASA, and I'm really honored to be able to share some thoughts, especially for you younger scientists today. I believe most or even all children are born with an inborn curiosity about nature and God's beautiful creation around us. I often enjoy finding something around uh, the yard or in the natural world to illustrate my points. And Jesus did that too. One time he said, our faith was like a small seed which can grow from a tiny speck into a much larger bush or even a tree. But like a plant, to grow it needs just the right conditions. And like a kid with special interest in the sciences, our faith in Jesus also needs to be nurtured and encouraged. Like a plant, faith should be especially cared for when it's new and young. And hey, by definition, you are young, so I hope you are doing things to help strengthen and grow your faith. Do you pray? Do you talk to God out loud or sometimes even in your head without talking and ask Him to help you? That's something all Christians should love to do many times during the day. And it's something our Lord Jesus did, too. I'm here in my yard, and I see around me all kinds of interesting and exciting things happening, which would make great illustrations for a sermon. One example is my yard is full of many of these plants called daylilies. These flowers are so beautiful. After they bloom, though, the flowers shrivel up and they turn into something like this. Just a little shrivelly dead flower. They last one day, the buds, and that's why they're called daylilies. I have a suspicion that this one is going to bloom tomorrow. This pod right here. Jesus also used flowers as an illustration, which we can read about in the Bible. Let me read for you a section of te Jesus' teachings recorded in Matthew, in chapter 6. Listen carefully for the part about flowers. So I tell you, don't worry about the things you need to live. Look at the birds. They don't plant, harvest, or save food in barns, but your Heavenly Father feeds them. Don't you know you are worth much more than they are? You cannot add any time to your life by worrying about it. And why do you worry about clothes? Look at the lilies of the field. See how they grow. They don't work or make clothes for themselves. But I tell you, even Solomon, the great and rich king, was not dressed as beautifully as one of these flowers. If God makes what grows in the field so beautiful, what do you think he will do for you? It's just grass. One day it's alive, and the next day someone throws it into a fire. But God cares enough to make it beautiful. Surely he will do much more for you. I think this teaching about not worrying is a really important thing now that we are concerned about disease spreading around the world. Of course, we should all do what we can to minimize the impact of this disease and protect each other. But we should not worry. Remember not to worry, but to pray for peace in every situation. The fact that God knows and cares for us is a great thing to remember, especially in times of trouble. God bless all of you young scientists and friends of the ASA, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the scripture today is Psalm 90. I will be reading uh, from the NIV version. Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. 
for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Through the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger, for the wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days all right, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to your children, to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is the word of the Lord. It is a tradition at the ASA annual meetings to take an offering for a local charity in the area where our conference is being held. Since we are virtual this year, we thought it would be nice to support a ministry of one of our members. We have selected ECHO, a mission organization founded by Martin and Bonnie Price, who are longstanding faithful ASA members in Fort Myers, Florida. For nearly 40 years, ECHO has been equipping and empowering hungry families with the knowledge and life-giving grace of God. They've impacted millions of lives by teaching small-scale, sustainable farming methods so families can provide for themselves and their communities. By tackling hunger at the source, they're growing hope from the ground up. ECHO introduces sustainable plan and technologies to farmers around the world who are struggling to feed their families. Their centers provide training and resources to empower small-scale family farmers in Southeast Asia, East Africa, and West Africa. Additionally, they distribute thousands of packets of trial seeds to farmers and help establish community seed banks to increase food security. If you are ever in the Fort Myers area, you will want to stop in for a tour of their global farm. Through their tours, you'll experience farming at its most creative with unique demonstrations, plants, and technologies being used to improve lives around the world. The farm attracts thousands of visitors annually, including many Christian college student groups. I've had the privilege of visiting the farm with an ASA group when Martin gave us a private tour. It is really a remarkable ministry and God has richly blessed the labor of Martin and Bonnie, humble servants, as the global world is being impacted for Christ in a powerful way. We will be virtually passing the plate now during the next musical piece and feel free to sing along. Please support this worthy organization by making a gift on the ASA website. You'll see the link in the chat or by sending a check to our home office. We will then collect the donations and forward them directly to ECHO. Thank you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.
It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you this morning's speaker and a friend of mine, Dr. Sean McDonough. Sean has served as professor of New Testament at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary since 2000. He came from Pacific Theological College in Fiji, where he had served as chair of the Biblical Studies Department and as lecturer in New Testament. His research interests include creation, cosmology in the Bible and the ancient Near East, Hellenistic Judaism, Greek philosophy and religion in the book of Revelation. Sean is very active in ministry as a Sunday school teacher and regular preacher here at First Congregational Church of Hamilton, a 308-year-old church on the north shore of Boston, where he and I, Craig Story, and several other ASA members attend. Sean and his wife, Ariana, who is an engineer, have four children, and they live here in Hamilton. His personal interests include supporting Boston sports teams, spending time with his family, traveling, and hiking. We had invited Sean to preach at our Sunday morning worship service at ASA 2018, our annual meeting at Gordon College, but he had an unexpected medical emergency and was unable to join us, so I'm delighted to welcome him today. Sean attended our Cambridge Roundtable on Science and Religion event on Wednesday evening, so some of you may have met him there. Sean is a visionary leader, a thoughtful scholar, and a passionate man of God. Thank you, Sean, for being with us. Please come and share. Do a social distancing handshake. Thanks so much, Vicki, for those two kind words. Uh, it is good to be with you, uh, albeit remotely. Uh, it was kidney stones that prevented me last time, kidney stones that failed to turn to dust despite uh, repeated assaults, uh, sonic assaults on them. So glad to be long done with that and here with you uh, to share uh, God's word from Psalm 90, which I believe has already been read. So as we turn to God's word, let us turn to him first in prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are God from everlasting to everlasting, and that we are creatures uh, of dust, creatures who are here today and gone tomorrow. And yet, Lord, by your grace, we thank you that you do give us life and indeed eternal life in Christ. And so we pray as we meditate on these truths from your word today, you might indeed give us a heart of wisdom to understand our finiteness, your infinite glory, and the love that unites you with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Vicki mentioned, I'm preaching here in Hamilton, Mass., on the North Shore of Boston. I myself grew up in Duxbury, Mass., a similar small town, but on the South Shore of Boston, right near Plymouth. And as that name Plymouth uh, indicates, we're very proud of our history down in Duxbury. It's founded just a few years after the Pilgrims landed 400 years ago. And of course, the native peoples had been around here thousands of years before that. And right in the middle of Duxbury is the Miles Standish, Miles Standish Burial Ground, the resting place of the mortal remains of Miles Standish, John Alden, and his wife Priscilla, who are immortalized, as we say, in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, The Courtship of Miles Standish. That was 400 years ago. About 40 years ago, though, the Miles Standish burial ground served as the home field for one of the uh, teams in our wiffle ball league there in Duxbury. Uh, if you hit it past the cannons, the commemorative cannons, then that was a home run. Uh, technically, I want to hasten to point out, it was really a, a commemorative portion of the graveyard, not graves themselves, though you still felt a little uneasy uh, playing around there. And, and if you think about emblems of the youthful incomprehension of their own mortality, we talk about whistling past the graveyard, but I think Wiffle ball in the graveyard may be an even more potent image of the complete obliviousness of young people and old people at times to the shortness of life. Well, here in Psalm 90, Moses is going to knock some sense 
into our heads. Now, he, st- he starts with an affirmation. God has been our refuge or our dwelling place from generation to generation. But the lessons on mortality start to come in right away in verse 2. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And the point here is pretty clearly that the mountains are really, really old and God was around even before that. And this makes it pretty ironic, to say the least, that some people who want to champion fidelity to scripture will talk about a young earth. Because the whole point of Psalm 90 is the earth symbolized by the mountains are really, really, really old. And so modern day geology with its millions and billions of years actually serves the theological intent of Psalm 90 perfectly. It gives us the proper perspective on our own finitude. And this helps reshape this understanding of how old things are, helps reshape uh, everyday activities. The other week, my family and I were vacationing in the White Mountains and did a lot of hiking, spectacular scenery. And geologists, uh, of whom some are listening and know these things far better than I do, say that those mountains are something like 130 million years old. That is tectonic plates smashed into one another and withdrew and as old mountains crumbled and then rose again, eventually the white mountains were given birth. One of my all-time favorite books that I've just read again and again is John McPhee's epic Annals of the Former World, which is an account of American geology as told by 20 years of conversation with uh, geologists as he traveled across the country, and he, better than anyone else, has captured the microscopic nature of human existence compared to the geology of our planet. Here's what McPhee says, human time, regarded in the perspective of geologic time, is much too thin to be discerned. The mark invisible at the end of the ruler If geologic time could somehow be seen in the perspective of human time, on the other hand, sea level would be rising and falling hundreds of feet, ice would come pouring over continents and as quickly go away, Yucatans and Floridas would be under the sun one moment and underwater the next, oceans would swing open like doors, mountains would grow like clouds and come down like melting sherbet, continents would crawl like amoebae, rivers would arrive and disappear, like rain streaks down an umbrella. Lakes would go away like puddles after rain, and volcanoes would light the earth as if it were a garden full of fireflies. And to the end of the program, man shows up, his ticket in hand, in in effect asking, what did I miss? And McPhee's answer is, practically everything. We're so small compared to what's going on around us. And and even when we begin to toss out numbers like 130 million years, we can sometimes be unwittingly, subtly inflating our egos still beyond reason. Because what, what do we mean when we say 130 million years as if we knew what we're talking about? Now, I grant that those numbers are very useful both for helping us appreciate the immensity of the time in which we live equally important for comparison that this rock formation is X million years old and this one is X minus 5 million or or whatever the numbers might be. But, But do we really understand as human beings what those numbers mean? 50 years, probably have some veteran saints out there who can, in their own life memory, appreciate what 50 years is. Maybe you talked to your old grandma who lived to a long age and maybe your age. So, so outer limit of living memory is going to be at most a couple of hundred years. Millions of years? Existentially, as human beings, at that point, in terms of what we can genuinely appreciate or comprehend, at that point, we are adrift, a drop in a sea of almost endless time. 
And so Moses goes on to say, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that's just gone by or like a watch in the night. Yet you sleep, sweep people away in the sleep of death. They're like the new grass of the morning. In the morning, it springs up new, but by evening, it's dry and withered. Now, that's a very sobering message about how brief our existence here on earth is. But Moses is a long way from done schooling us. Because he goes on to say, starting in verse 7, we're consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. So, not only are our lives small, they pass away under God's wrath. As you're probably aware, Moses lived a pretty tumultuous life full of exiles and plagues and rebellions that ended with the earth swallowing people up. So, it's not surprising that he might speak in these vivid terms. But even though he's not giving a full-blown theology of sin and death and judgment, it's certainly at a minimum giving us a sense of how we experience life in this world and more experience how, more importantly, how we experience death in this world. And this struck me as I was thinking about the early theological or even popular response to COVID. Lots of people ask, is this a sign of God's judgment? Now, that's an incredibly complicated question. And to give a really definitive answer, you'd have to be a prophet of a very high order. And so I can't pronounce definitively on that at all. But I will say this. I didn't hear a lot of people saying, do you think this is a sign of God's favor? We don't experience death and decay and destruction as just things that happen, more random collisions of atoms in the void. There are biological explanations for mortality. John Wood has a wonderful paper on that theme. But whatever we do with death theologically or philosophically or scientifically, we experience it as a strong negative. We feel as if God's wrath is upon us. We grieve and we weep and we wail and we wonder what went wrong. Well, whether it's the mere brevity of life or the fact that we experience death as as something, again, that's gone horribly wrong, Psalm 90 is a hard lesson to learn, but it's a crucial one. And that's why right here in the middle of the psalm, there's this Crucial summary, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The teaching in these first several verses is not meant to crush us and depress us. It's simply meant to get us to wake up to the reality of the brevity of our existence. And yet it's a lesson that folks in the West especially do their very best to avoid learning. We do everything we can to escape what is so patently obvious. And we we walk about assuming we've always been here, that we have a necessary existence, and we need to be shocked out of that. And when we do recognize that, in point of fact, we haven't been around forever, we then try to establish some solidity for ourselves through our achievements. So sometimes we think, well, I'll get famous and people will carve my name in stone, make statues of me, then I'll endure. Well, if you've been paying attention to the news lately, you'll realize that even if you do get a statue, which I'm sorry to say is a very unlikely possibility, that doesn't mean that somebody else isn't going to come along and tear it down when they don't like you. 
And as for stony memorials, I would direct your attention once again to the old Miles Standish burial ground. Those ancient headstones are wearing away, grain by grain, just as surely as the people they're trying to commemorate. And often, as you go through these old graveyards here in New England, you can't even make out the names anymore. And even those majestic white mountains will ever so gradually descend back to the dust. Well, we say, maybe stone is not enduring enough, but technology, maybe that can free us from our limitations and make us like the omnipresent, omniscient, everlasting God. Now, I certainly appreciate the benefits the modern world brings us. I can speak here in Hamilton, Mass. We can record it, beam it all over the world, and that, I hope, is of some use to you all. But the temptation is we then feel like we're kind of omnipresent. The problem is I'm still here in my limited, dusty frame. I am not, in fact, everywhere. And I have a question to ask, as we have all endured months of pseudo-contact through Zoom. It is one question. As you use this technology, do you feel more solid, more substantial, more connected, more godlike? Or is it more like the hobbit Bilbo Baggins, who after long years spent with his magical ring said, I feel thin sort of stretched, like butter scraped over too much bread. I feel that way after five minutes of Zoom, and the more I do it, the more thin and stretched I feel. Well, finally, in seeking to avoid the painfully obvious realities of Psalm 90, the Christian might say, well, that's fine, but I'm exempt from this lesson. Moses, the Old Testament, is all kind of primitive and old and grumpy and negative. But now in Jesus, it's all good. I've been given a waiver from the transience of mortal existence. Now, there's a way in which there's kind of some truth to that. Unfortunately, though, you can't, even as a Christian, beg off the assignment of learning about your mortality. I can demonstrate that with a line, not from Psalm 90, but from the New Testament. Indeed, from Jesus' own brother James, who in chapter 4, verse 14 of his epistle says, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And so, whether we're living in the Old Covenant, living in the New Covenant, then, now, tomorrow, We need still to learn to number our days if we're to have a heart of wisdom. Well, that's some pretty tough love from Psalm 90. Are we then just left in the dust? Well, remember how the psalm began. God has been our dwelling place from generation to generation begins with a remembrance of God's faithfulness in times past, and it's appropriate then that it ends with words of hope. The miracle of Psalm 90 is that after staring death squarely in the face, not trying to flee from finitude, but accepting it, after all that, it can end on a note of trust. And the key here lies in the comparison of verse 3 with verse 13, in verse 3, we read that God turns people back to dust. But that same word now appears in verse 13 as God pleads, uh, Moses pleads with God to turn back to his people. Return, O Lord. But that word really is turn, O Lord. Turn, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, 
And for as many years as we've seen evil, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Death is not the final word. Whatever Moses may have said about God's wrath being upon the people, he knows that God is fundamentally merciful. And so when Moses was there in the supreme moment of revelation, as God showed himself and declared his name before the prophet on Sinai, he said, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, merciful in thousands, judging in threes. Just incredibly more merciful than judgmental. And the privilege of being a Christian is we now know how God has displayed that mercy, which has always been his. How he has turn to us by becoming flesh as Jesus embraced our life in all its frailty, even embracing our death as his own so that we might share in his everlasting life. Now we do still turn to dust and the great theologian Irenaeus in his Against Heresies, book five, chapter two, gives a wonderful explanation of why that's the case. He explains that precisely because we're so full of ourselves and assume we've been around forever that it's necessary for God to let our bodies return to dust so that when we are raised with a a memory of what we've been and what we've experienced even in death, when we're raised from that, we'll know that it's God's power and not our own that has given us this eternal life. And yet even more surprising than that message of hope are the concluding words of the psalm, establish the work of our hands, that even in our dusty, finite present, our work can be meaningful because God, the eternal, everlasting, omnipotent God, can give it the kind of solidity that we can't when we go about things in our own self-will. We remain creatures of a moment, but that moment infused by the grace of God can become a more enduring monument than any stonemason could carve. That as we go about our everyday work as geologists or physicists or chemists or whatever it is that we do, as we do that unto the Lord, though no one may read our work, though we may never reach those goals we set for ourselves, nonetheless, work done in love for the sake of God can be established by his word of grace. And so we work diligently, even as we work faithfully, knowing we're finite, knowing that in and of ourselves, we can't make things endure, but trusting that God can. I want to conclude with a little illustration from one of the best sermons I've heard. This would have been about 20 years ago, and it was actually preached, funnily enough, by my brother. But my brother, thinking back to his own high school memories, not of wiffle ball, but of school, recounted a true story of uh, one amazing moment when a substitute teacher came into his class. And rather than just sitting there and having the students throw paper airplanes at him or whatever a substitute teacher usually has to endure, took a piece of chalk and drew an enormous line all the way across the chalkboard. And then he took the chalk and dramatically made a dot in the middle of that almost endless line. And he said, in the great line of life, you are nothing but an insignificant speck. (laughs) Well, the class, of course, uh, was in an uproar after that. And all these people, these young people started clamoring about how their lives really were significant. My, My brother was not a Christian at that point, but was a philosophically minded fellow thought he's absolutely right. That just objectively speaking on that great, almost infinite line of time, our 70, 80 years really are a a speck. But the title of that sermon he preached was Significant Specks. And that I think captures better than anything that paradoxical message of Psalm 90. We have to recognize our dust-like, speck-like existence. That's that's what we are compared to the vastness of space, the almost infinitude of time, and the genuine infinitude 
of God. But the miracle is that just as Jesus somehow, as God, took on human flesh, so he can take our flesh and give it significance. And so Psalm 90, which can seem like a, almost a psalm of lament, is really a psalm of trust, praise, and hope. And I can do no better to conclude than by citing the, what's effectively a paraphrasing of Psalm 90 by the great hymn writer Isaac Watts. The hymn's 300 years old, but still captures the message beautifully because it just repackages it in beautiful Verse. I'll just quote two verses, the the tough lesson of our finitude and the great message of divine hope, and we'll close with that. Watts writes in the hymn, Our God, Our Help, Our Ages in Ages Past, time like an ever rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. But it concludes with this Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guard while troubles last and our eternal home. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of this hymn be the light on our long path of life, long to us, so brief to you. May we indeed find in you and you alone our significance and our eternal home. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Those are powerful words. I'm thanking Sean uh, for this reminder of our finitude, our finiteness, like a dream we pass. And uh, all of this ambiguity of our life, it humbles us before the Lord. Uh, seems, Sean, like we have uh, real troubles, real problems getting together in person. And first it was kidney stones, and now COVID has distanced us again from you. Uh, We all are feeling a bit like uh, Bilbo, a bit stretched this morning in this uh, Zoom space. So, Sean, um, as you're reviewing this in the future, we hope that the third time will be the charm and you can meet us in person at the ASA. So now we come to our time of corporate prayer. And uh, here, uh, this uh, call to worship. I will give thanks to the Lord. With my whole heart, I will recount all his wonderful deeds. I will be glad and I will exult in him. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Amen. So today, we're going to focus on three things in prayer. Uh, I'm going to do this a little bit formally, and uh, we'll all engage this way. We're going to talk about forgiveness, grace, and thanksgiving. So after I announce a topic, we'll pause for. prayer individually, and I will end each section here with Lord hear our prayer, and I'll announce the next topic. Number one, forgiveness. Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We confess now our sin, structurally, corporately, individually, Sin that by the blood of Christ and by your grace is forgiven. Lord, hear our prayer. Second, for grace, grace for those who grieve. On Friday evening, we honored our members who had passed away this year. Uh, This morning, uh, we're going to add a name, Stanley Permeter from Fort Myers, Florida. We got word uh, just this weekend from his daughter, Carol, that Stanley had passed away on Wednesday at the age of 99 years. May the Lord richly bless his memory to all of us and to his family. 
Let's pray now for uh, the family and friends of those members who've passed away. We'll pray for comfort in their grief and loss. And let's extend that uh, to all of the suffering and those who have lost loved ones uh, in this COVID pandemic and in other ways. And I'll mention this morning to pray especially for uh, Aoife Zayden and her family, one of our board members, our council members. Uh, Aoife sent me a note uh, just yesterday saying that her, uh, her aunt in Ohio had taken a fall and unfortunately passed away from that fall. So I know Aoife and her family are grieving at this time, so you can remember her. And you may know people in your ex extended family or close family. Pray for them as well. Lord, hear our prayer. And then prayers of thanksgiving. We have so much to be grateful for today. Yes, there are troubles and there are challenges, but we've been reminded this week that God is good and that there are many good things in life. Our lives are full, our cups are overflowing. Now, we science folks especially have been richly gifted and blessed and given opportunities for service. Uh, reminded of that all the time. We, we have the chance to care for people in the most tangible ways. So let's now give thanks to, uh, for those things that enrich our lives and in the lives of others, uh, literally around the world, we give thanks. Lord, hear our prayer. And then finally to close, for this day, for the breath of life, Lord, we give you thanks. For all that you have given us, we give you thanks. Lord, we love you. Be with us today and in all we do. Amen.
I'm thankful for my 40 years with the ASA and for the beauty of God's creation. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Beidler, president of the Washington, D.C. chapter of the ASA. And I'm thankful for those of you in the organization who prayed for my job situation during these uncertain times. God not only answered your prayers, but his answer exceeded my expectations, giving me an opportunity to work with some cutting-edge researchers and engineers. I praise God for thousands of hard-working scientists around the world who are working to create a vaccine to stop the COVID pandemic, to bring about the common good, to the praise of his glorious grace. Hello, I'm Larry Zook, and we're thankful for family and friends and all of God's blessings. And I'm Christina Zook, and we're also thankful for our back deck where we can watch the sunset. Bye. Bye. Greetings from the Miller household. Uh, we are uh, enjoying our property here. One of the things we're very grateful for is the uh, stewardship that we've been given over this property. And also thankful despite the COVID frustrations that we have in with us over the summer, uh, which has been a real blessing. So hello to everyone in the ASA. Hi, my name is Graham Warner. Uh, I just want to hear a testimony that God's been really great to me recently. I had uh, just had skin uh, cancer and had surgery last week, and God was clearly with me, he comforted me, and curing me dreadfully. So, thank you. Uh, great blessings to each of you. Hello, we are Andrea and Carolina. Um, we thank the Lord for the gift He has given us, uniting and forming a family. And uh, in this difficult moment for the epidemic, uh, we pray Him uh, um, to help every one of us. God bless you. Bye. Good morning. I'm Stephen Ball, and I'd like to give thanks for God, to God for His grace and for my new wife, Emma Aguilar Mejia, who we just got married to on March 6th of this year. Here's a picture of us. Hi, my name is Lauren Phillips, and I'm thankful for God's love and faithfulness during this season of uncertainty. I'm also very grateful for my family and friends and the community that I've built during this season and the love and support that they share. And I'm also very thankful for my cute cats, as you can see one of them here. I thank God for the progress in medical science and the cooperation of citizens around the world that has made it that the number of infections and deaths are much lower than they could have been in this pandemic. And then I praise God for the beauty of His nature reflected in fjords, mountains, farmlands, rocks, and forests here in Norway. I'm very grateful during this time of working from home that allows me the flexibility to be more present with my family, with practical things from passing along family recipes to holding deep conversations about equity and justice. Mountains bow down and the seas roar at the sound of
Wow, wasn't that a moving piece? If we were all together, I could see lots of hands being raised. It's so neat to see how God is working in the lives of our members around the globe. And it's been an amazing week here at our Summer Something series. And my heart is overflowing with joy and gratitude. Thank you to many of you who have joined us throughout the week and engaging virtually. While born out of necessity, we saw participation of a large and diverse audience who would not have otherwise had the opportunity. Between our prayer and praise time starting last Monday to the two brown bag lunches, the fellows round table event, our state of the ASA and popular ice cream social, which by the way, went on for hours, to the student and early career mini conference and CWIS after party yesterday, and finally this worship service. What an appropriate way to end an amazing week filled with many blessings. We will be posting these events on our website for you to share with others and stay tuned for a survey and new events planned for this coming fall and winter. And finally, please join us for the virtual coffee hour, a time to get to know others from around the globe immediately following. You want to use the link that you'll see posted in the chat function, which will be available till the end of the postlude. So grab a cup of coffee and join us in 10 minutes at 1.10 Eastern Time. Now to receive the benediction taken from Ecclesiastes 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or imagine according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.
Oh 